We are now broadcasting. Uh, we see folks filtering in now. And uh, we'll get started in just a moment. I hope everybody can see us okay. I should see Emerson and myself. And looking at the chat window, hey, John. I see you said hey to me. Nice to see you or nice to hear from you. We'll give it just a couple more minutes and then we're going to get started. I hope everybody is doing well in the uh, shelter in place work from home world we now live in. I'm calling in from one of our uh, one of our Test robot, our Robo Llama Farms. Uh, the first, probably the first ever robot llama farm in Seattle. Yeah, and we are practicing extreme social distancing here because Emerson's in Seattle and I'm in Peru. So, very little chance that there'll be any sort of uh, uh, transmission. All right, excellent. Uh, well, we will go ahead and get started here. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, good morning and good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, we're really excited about this webinar because this is our, uh, not our introduction, we actually did that last month, but this is our first webinar on our test robot, which is a new product that we're really excited to introduce. Um, it's really a natural extension uh, to what we've already built, which I think you'll see as we go through it. Uh, but we think it's it's really exciting for our customers and uh, we think it's a very helpful thing for the voice ecosystem in general. Um, and so with that brief introduction, I'm going to share my screen here. And, you know, just briefly, I. Some of you may know me already. I'm John Kelby. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Bespoken, uh, and I'm joined here with Emerson Sklar. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emerson Sklar. I'm the chief evangelist of Bespoken. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're going to be going through our Bespoken test robot. Um, you know, do a brief introduction to what we do in general as a company, talk about some of the market trends that we see, especially ones that we think are sort of spurring on uh, the need that we see for this new product. Um, talk about some of the challenges of testing, um, uh, do a nice demonstration, really in-depth demonstration of what we have to offer, um, and then we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, I should mention, um, you know, one, we're recording the session, so if you lose connectivity or if you drop off, we'll be sending around the recording afterwards, which I think is a really helpful thing. Uh, additionally, you'll see there's a chat window there as well as a Q&A window. Um, Emerson and I will try to monitor that as we're going through. Um, and if you have questions as we're going through it, you know, we'll try to kind of work that in uh, to make this a bit interactive. Uh, so do feel free to ask us questions. We, you know, uh, we'd like to make sure that we cover everything well. And so as background on us, you know, we're the leaders in voice testing, tuning and monitoring. Um, we're the only company recognized by Amazon and Google uh, to provide this. Uh, the way that we do it is we provide um, the ability for testers and developers 
to simulate real people talking to uh, devices, to voice first devices. Uh, we capture and analyze the responses. Um, we do this in a way that's very fast, it's very reliable, um, and it's completely automated. Um, and based on the analysis we do with those results, we actually provide very specific guidance on how to correct any issues that are seen, as well as how to tune um, you know, anything's, anything with the uh, speech recognition or NLU. Uh, so we try to make it very easy for people to really optimize these AI-based systems. Um, and we work with a lot of great companies that are out there, um, you know, helping them build very high quality, reliable voice experiences, uh, really helping them to, to achieve, you know, uh, what we think is a gold standard sort of five-star voice experiences and doing it in a way that removes a lot of the tedium. Uh, it's definitely a pain point for our customers, not just that sometimes these things don't work so well, it's also a pain point just going through and actually testing, uh, you know, being sort of trapped in a room, chanting at devices. It's not a lot of fun. Uh, and we like to think our customers really wholeheartedly agree. People like Mercedes-Benz, Ford, Roku, uh, Spotify. Uh, these are some of the dozens of customers that we have using their software. Uh, and Emerson, I'm gonna invite you to talk about some of the demand that we see. Yeah, thanks, John. So it's, it's really pretty fascinating for me to see how voice as, uh, as a community, as a technology has grown over the last several years. One thing that has, uh, has really emerged is both the consumption and utilization of these devices, as well as the proliferation of different ways of interacting with voice. Uh, we have some, you know, some stats uh, from the past year or so up there on the screen. Uh, first, pretty amazing that uh, that almost half of the world's population uh, have used voice assistance over the last year. Um, in, in addition, uh, Google announced at CES this year that they are at over 500 million, over half a billion monthly active users of Google Assistant, uh, largely driven by Google Assistant being present on, uh, on many of the smartphones. And then uh, this, this past year alone, there are over 130 million people, in the, only in the United States, over 130 million people that used voice assistants in their automobiles, either the built-in voice assistant or something like Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Uh, PricewaterhouseCooper a few years ago introduced uh, some, some pretty interesting statistics about what, uh, what physical platforms people are using voice technology on. Not, not a big surprise that smartphones do lead the charge. Um, you know, uh, Google has the lion's share of the, uh, of the voice assistant market, uh, has the lion's share of the smartphone market as well. Um, but that obviously also then includes people who are using their smartphone-driven voice assistant while, while in an automobile, again, through something like, uh, like Android Auto. You know, we, we often get stuck sort of in this uh, smart speaker-only world, but consumers, users, really do demand access to this technology uh, both, both ubiquitous access and easy access to it, really, whichever way they want, uh, whichever way they want to interact in the moment, whichever way is most convenient. Uh, and so that I don't know if it showed up on the screen there, uh, but I was just looking at the Q and A, and somebody asked if the presentation will be available afterwards. And yes, certainly it will be. Hmm. Great. Uh, so it's great that, that all of our potential customers, all of our users are utilizing the technology, but it's not, uh, it's not all rosy. It's not, uh, it's not a perfect experience for most people. And so if you think about the few different categories of challenges that uh, prevent this from being used everywhere in the world, from being used uh, you know, by everybody every day. So a, a couple different categories. The first is the challenges that the users themselves uh, actually face. So VoiceBot obviously puts out, uh, puts out fantastic statistics. This, the one on the left is one from uh, just a few months ago. Discovery continues to be a significant challenge for many organizations, you know, finding ways to get the really compelling voice apps that they are putting out there into people's hands continues to be tough. And we've seen some customers have great success with social media promotion, uh, with in app, in traditional app advertising or in, in website advertising. Um, but if, if you think about that, if you, you could be making a stellar voice experience, but if you don't have a way to get into the hands for your users, that's, that's really a you know, pretty significant missed opportunity. 
it also then further underscores the need to have that experience be absolutely perfect. You, you want to make sure that from the second that somebody gets their hands, gets their ears on, uh, on your voice experience, that they are delighted by it. Really, the only way to do that is to, uh, you know, is to establish a rigorous baseline and mechanism to, to measure the quality of that app. Uh, that second graph there, I, I find, you know, really fascinating. Uh, VoiceBot puts out uh, year over year tracks what characteristics users look for in uh, in voice assistants, and the for the last three years or so, the leading characteristic is the accuracy of that speech recognition. Um, some other, you know, there's a huge, huge gulf there between these four, the top four characteristics and the lower ones, um, you know, things like, does it actually work? How much it can do? Does it respond in, uh, you know, in a reasonable amount of time? Does it have good quality? Those are all very important, but the, the most significant characteristic is how well it understands the individual users. And we as developers, we might say, hey, well, Amazon gives me this platform or Google gives me this platform or I'm rolling my own or something. I, you know, I don't have a whole lot of control over that speech recognition accuracy. So you might try and throw up your hands, but, but your users are not gonna know that it wasn't your problem. They're not gonna say, oh, well, it's Amazon. So Mr. Big Brand, I forgive you. They just know it doesn't work. They just know that they're not having a good experience. They're not gonna continue using it. And what's, what's really interesting and something that, uh, you know, that we're really passionate about is that you as a developer actually can make a significant impact on that speech recognition accuracy. There are tools and processes in place that work very, very well to make sure that the platform, even with its built-in biases between accents and uh, you know, non-native non accents, ages, things like that, uh, make sure that, that it actually does understand the users. So those are some of the user-focused challenges, but then some things that you know <laughs> that we may uh, may live and breathe every day. They're challenges for us, just as people are trying to create for these platforms. Um, the the first challenge, and this is something that I've been saying for years, is that the way that we've done testing in the past really doesn't fit the new paradigm of voice. Um, it's great that uh, we may be experts in testing for GUI-based applications, but uh, like like Brett Kinsella says, uh, you know, everybody's thumbs are the same, but everybody's voices are different. And so, uh, you know, I might be able to really effectively test a, a mobile app, same way that you might be able to really effectively test a mobile app. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're going to have the same, uh, the same experience when we're trying to test this voice app. It, 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 uh, even for an organization like Amazon or Google, it makes, a, makes, a, makes it a huge challenge to understand how it's gonna perform in your user's hands. Um, the second characteristic is that the, the simple fact of the acoustic environment, the interaction with, uh, with audio itself is, is a significant challenge. It is really tough for uh, for any organization to know what's going to happen outside of a laboratory. And so, you know, if I'm driving, uh, that looks like a 308 Ferrari or something, if I'm driving my, uh, my cool Ferrari and somehow I built in voice characteristics, you know, I might know that it works really well if I'm sitting in, uh, sitting in my living room where I have my car parked. But if I'm driving uh, at 10 miles an hour, at 30 miles an hour, if I have the windows up versus the windows down, if I have music playing, I, I don't know how well it's going to work, and those things are very difficult, uh, and you know, often sometimes dangerous to try and test with real people. Um, but but they are certainly important to to cover if you want to make sure that your user is having a great experience. Uh, the the last one, and this is uh, the sort of blessing and the curse of uh, of spending our time working with these AI driven platforms, is that they're constantly evolving, and so Amazon and Google are doing a great job of uh, you know, of really continuously improving those products that they provide to us. Um, they aren't always articulating exactly what the changes are that they're introducing. And then simply by virtue of it being an AI driven platform, a lot of changes that are happening, we as humans, we as developers don't really have a whole lot of insight into them. And so you might have something that performs beautifully today, um, but you don't know that it's going to perform beautifully a week from now, a month from now, six months from now. It's not like if I made a, you know, made an Android app, I know that it's going to be the same until 
uh, Android releases a new, a new operating system version. These are changing every day. And so the only way to ensure that the investment that you've made, that the high quality product that you created continues to perform like a high quality product uh, is, to, is to set some kind of quality baseline to measure where it is today and then continually test it to ensure that you're driving towards optimal, uh, ultimately increased quality over time. And then uh, above the people who are actually doing the implementation themselves, above the sort of developer level, there are a lot of challenges for people who are deciding what platform to invest in. Uh, so this is the VoiceBot gown model. It's a really, really nice, clear way to articulate the major categories of voice assistants that exist on the market today. So the ones that are utilized the most, um, both both in and out of cars are these general purpose ones, things like Alexa, Google Assistant, um, you know, they are ubiquitous. They have very broad feature sets, but they don't, uh, you know, don't support some of the more niche capabilities uh, and don't allow for the type of customization that some organizations may like. Uh, when, when we think about some of the others, like the owned area, you know, organizations like Mercedes have made significant investments in creating their their own internal uh, voice assistant. These, if, if any of you saw the Super Bowl last year, you know they had a great, uh, a great advertisement that they did showing showcasing the uh, the Hey Mercedes assistant. And so they made that decision because they wanted much greater control. They wanted uh, much greater control both over the experience and over the data that's flowing through the system. They wanted to reflect their brand identity in a way that. You know that you really couldn't get for uh, if they were using one of these otherwise off-the-shelf voice platforms and so regardless of which one you choose and, and we see that organizations often have to pick one that you know doesn't fit perfectly into one of these quadrants you have to make a you know make an informed decision about which one meets the needs of your business but they all have their pros and cons they all have their strengths and weaknesses and all present really unique testing challenges that uh, you know that are generally quite difficult to try and uh, try and account for using the processes that we've we've followed in the past. All right, thank you for that overview, Emerson. That's I think that's really helpful. Um, in terms of how we actually affect all this testing. Um, these are sort of the key considerations that we've identified for developers uh, and for builders of voice experiences. Um, starting at the top here, um, you know, working across the entire development lifecycle, we offer tools for unit testing, um, which a lot of you may be familiar with. Uh, the unit testing is really focused on making sure that the code works correctly. Um, the, the benefits are, you know, many fold with this. Uh, what we would highlight is uh, by using the unit testing, you're going to uh, be able to develop much faster because you're able to do things locally on your laptop uh, without getting stuck doing lots of deployments, um, you know, either pushing out new versions of an interaction model or new versions of a Lambda. Um, and then you're also going to have these automated tests that you can run at any time. Um, so those two things together, it leads to a higher quality outcome that comes along much faster. Um, and so it's a really fantastic tool for developers, um, but we don't think that people should stop there. Uh, the unit testing really is going to focus on that code part. Uh, when you're thinking about making sure the system works as a whole, uh, the end-to-end -end testing is really critical. And end-to-end -end testing means uh, really, you know, obviously testing the full integration of a system, but especially for voice, it means testing that AI component, the speech recognition and the NLU. Uh, that's obviously critical, and that's really just as important as testing the code uh, portions. Uh, so the end-to-end -end testing, uh, we've typically done this using our virtual devices. We're going to tell you how we do it with our test robots in a moment. But for our virtual devices, the way they work is uh, we actually have our own um, software-only implementation of a physical device, you know, it it's, works very similar to what you have with an Amazon Echo or with a Google Home, but it comes with this difference that you can interact with it completely programmatically. Uh, so in doing this, it makes it much easier to write your test, but it's very closely simulating an actual person sitting there and talking to a device. Um, and that's extremely useful 
uh, for doing that full cycle of testing. Um, and so with that end-to-end -end testing, you can do complete regression tests, really do thorough QA. Um, and then as you get into the mode where your skill is actually live, uh, you can do the continuous testing, uh, which we also refer to as monitoring. What we're doing there is we're typically taking a subset of those tests that we do for the end-to-end -end testing, and then we're running them on a routine basis. Uh, so for functional tests, you might have 100 test cases, you might have 1,000. Um, you know, you're not gonna run all of those every five minutes. Um, with the continuous testing, you take you know, key scenarios and then you run those on a five or 30 minute basis. Something that's gonna really exercise the complete system um, and ensure that it's working as a whole uh, routinely. Um, but then also, um, you know, alert you if there's any issues with it at all. Um, similarly, uh, and also building upon our virtual devices, we offer the usability performance testing. And this piece, you know, it's interesting because it is it is a different uh, type of testing. All the pieces I mentioned just a moment ago, those exist, uh, you know, on web and mobile, there's clear analogs for it. People that have been working on those platforms for a long time are familiar with doing unit testing, end-to-end -end testing, monitoring, all that sort of good stuff. The usability performance testing is something that's really specific to AI and voice, and it's to really narrow in on that voice component and make sure that it's working correctly. So when we do that, that type of testing, we basically ignore the code, ignore that back-end fulfillment, um, and try to test as rigorously as we can, um, you know, just the AI model itself. Uh, and we run lots of different utterances, lots of different um, samples of people talking at the model so that we can measure it and then tune it as best as possible. Um, and in doing that, we often see people when, when we're first starting to test their models, they might have something that works 75 to 85% accuracy. Uh, accurately, uh, which if you think about it is not very good because that means that it's having errors somewhere between 15% to 25% of the time. That is really likely to lead to frustrated users. Um, and so using the usability performance testing, just doing really basic tuning techniques, we typically see people go from, you know, somewhere around 80% accuracy up to 95 to 99% accuracy. Using more advanced techniques, we see people get even beyond that. Um, but the key thing is that by using this, you're able to really rapidly improve uh, how well users are understood, which as we showed you before, is uh, the biggest consideration for users and the biggest frustration for users uh, in working with voice assistants. And Yeah, I should just mention, because I saw a notification on my phone about it. So it, it does seem like someone sort of Zoom bombed us. They put some messages in the chat window. Uh, I apologize for that. <laughs> Somebody knows how to delete that. If Emerson knows how to delete it, please do. I don't know how to, uh, but sorry about that. Um, we're very technically savvy, but I guess we're not, um, not immune to the Zoom bombing. Um, Anyway, so end-to-end -end testing, to show you guys in more depth how that works, uh, you see the slide here, but I'm just gonna show you a demo uh, on how we do this typically. Now, these are tests that we set up to use our virtual devices. The great news is with our test robots that we're gonna show you in a moment, you can use the exact same type of test. Uh, so, you know, your test protocol really does not need to change at all. Uh, we're just opening up new possibilities for testing. And so we maintain the exact same APIs, the exact same scripting capabilities. Uh, everything that you may be accustomed to doing with us, you can continue to do with the test robots and you can actually sort of swap them in and out uh, with the virtual devices seamlessly, uh, which we think is uh, a rather amazing thing and also a very useful thing. Um, but this is sort of a classic test. Um, this is for an Alexa skill that's called Bring. Uh, it's a grocery list skill. Uh, very simple, very nice, nice skill. Um, and here's probably the simplest possible test you could write. And so here we're saying open Bring. 
uh, that's what we're gonna actually say to the device. And then welcome to bring, that's what we're expecting back as a response. Uh, so open bring, um, this, this text, this is gonna be transformed into audio. We use text-to-speech to do that. Uh, we take that audio then and we send it to Alexa or Google Assistant or Houndify or you know, whatever platform you wanna test. Uh, that in turn will either be handled directly by the assistant or can be passed on to your skill or action. Uh, we get a response from the skill or action. The response is a combination of audio and JSON. You know, the audio is the spoken portion, the JSON uh, contains information about you know, the display, other sorts of metadata. Uh, and then uh, with that audio part, we turn it back into text and then we compare it to this expected response. So lots of steps that are happening in that chain, but in terms of the actual test itself, you know, we think conceptually it's really simple and intuitive, easy to write, easy to maintain, um, easy to even share with stakeholders uh, for auditing. Um, but you know, some complex pieces to actually make that all work together. Um, these tests can get a lot more complicated. I'm not gonna go through the full set of capabilities here in this uh, webinar, but uh, you know, we have underlying SDKs and APIs. You can really do very sophisticated testing with it. Uh, and just to highlight some of those more advanced capabilities, you know, here's a test that's running through a whole conversation. So it's not just launching a skill, it's having a conversation back and forth. It's using a wild card. It could be using a regular expression. We can check variable different responses. So, um, you know, if your skill kind of varies up how it uh, replies to users, we can also test for that rather easily. Um, you know, you can easily create very sophisticated, very thorough tests, uh, you know, that we still think are highly readable and maintainable. Um, and so that's how we've done our tests using virtual devices. Still a fantastic way to do it, uh, but then, you know, we're extremely excited. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, we're excited to offer our test robots because we have run into some catches with this. So what are those? You know, what are the sort of gotchas that we have using virtual devices? Well, one is not all platforms are open. Uh, so a lot of our customers, they may be using Siri, they may, may be using Bixby, they may have a mobile app in which they put their own voice assistant into it. Um, you know, there's a lot of platforms out there where they don't have an ability to, to actually offer a virtual device. Um, and so that's a limitation. Um, and that's, you know, for a lot of those devices, there's really no way to do automated testing uh, before we uh, created this, this test robot. Um, so uh, overcoming that limitation was very important for us. Additionally, the device platforms that are out there their work's in progress, they're evolving constantly, uh, and the sort of capabilities that we can offer via virtual device is not always the same as what you're gonna have uh, for first party devices. Um, and so there's, you know, there's features, for example, with Alexa that, you know, they're only available, you know, essentially to Amazon. That's okay, I mean, that's, that's certainly Amazon's prerogative to do that, but it, again, um, we've seen this become a frustration for our customers where they really do want to uh, automate their testing and tuning process completely. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you get into very specific form factors, very specific scenarios that have to do with the physical device itself. Um, and so I put a picture of the Echo Spot here. Uh, I know that's a discontinued product, but I, I think it's a good one to pick on because one, people still have it, even though it's discontinued, right? Uh, presumably Amazon sold a good number of these. Uh, in addition, it's got, I mean, the screen is really cool, right? But it's, it's this tiny little form factor. And if you've been building for say the Echo Show uh, and you're used to having a larger screen and you focused yourself on that, uh, you may be surprised, especially if you don't have an Echo Spot on your desk, you may be really surprised by what comes up on it. Um, it may not look like what you were sort of expecting or hoping for. Um, and so having the ability to test these very specific form factors to make sure that no matter where your voice experience is being delivered, uh, that it really looks great and behaves great. Um, these are all sort of obstacles that we are running into. And it's what led us to 
the bespoke and test robot. Um, and so here we show the test robot in the box that it sits in. Uh, we tend to highlight the box a lot uh, just because it does the soundproofing and it's sort of a critical piece to making the whole thing work. But in terms of the components of it, uh, what we put inside those boxes, there's obviously the device being tested. Uh, there's a microphone, and that's what we're uh, using to capture responses from the device. There's a computer that sort of operates the whole thing. Uh, there's a camera that captures the image of what's on the device, and that's how we validate the display. Uh, and then there's a speaker as well, and that's how we actually talk to the device. Um, so we have all these pieces that come together so that we can thoroughly test any sort of device that you can think of. And so how does it come together? Well, let's, let's think about a really simple sort of test uh, before we go into some more in-depth demos. Uh, if we say, Alexa, turn on the lights, and then we're looking for uh, an expected re response of, okay, I turn them on. What actually happens with that test, and you can write one that looks exactly like that, uh, is the test robot speaks the utterance via that speaker to the device under test. So it actually you know, uh, plays audio akin to you know, uh, myself or Emerson or anyone just talking to a normal device. Uh, that device that's being tested, uh, it's gonna process that utterance. It comes back with an audio response in most cases. We capture that audio response with our microphone and we're converting that uh, to actual text uh, using speech to text. Uh, we're also capturing the graphical response by taking a picture of what's on the screen uh, and we apply machine vision and OCR to that. And by doing that, we're able to capture the text uh, that's on the screen. Um, and then we take all that output and then we're comparing it to our actual test. So when we actually run, you know, when we do this utterance, we get back that, that uh, text transcription of what was said in reply, and we're gonna then finally compare it to here. And so it's really similar in terms of everything that's happened uh, to what we were doing with the virtual devices, but it, with the difference that we're using real analog audio and video to do that testing. Um, very cool and opens up uh, you know, the ability for us to essentially test any type of device that you can think of. Uh, and so, you know, some of the great benefits of doing this, you know, you don't have to rely on human testers. Uh, it's, you know, saves an immense amount of labor. Uh, it's extremely reliable. Uh, in running this, you're able to run the exact same test day in, day out, uh, in the exact same environment, using speakers. Uh, if you're using generated audio, they're going to use the exact same inflection and pronunciation. Um, so you can get really consistent results. Um, and it's extremely customizable. We've, you know, we've already, in the time that uh, essentially we started pilot, uh, piloting this product last year, at the end of last year, uh, through you know, just in the last month, we've seen a ton of different scenarios. We've seen uh, custom devices, we've seen mobile devices, um, you know, interesting scenarios with the Amazon Echo devices, uh, Google Assistant. Um, it's been remarkable the types of use cases and scenarios we've been able to test in a short period of time. Um, and so it all kind of adds up to the fact that, uh, you know, that, that slogan that we started with that. Uh, with our test robots, if you can talk to it, we can test it. Um, and so to show us now how that's true, I'm going to stop sharing and let Emerson do a demonstration. All right, let's see. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Don't take that as a yes. <laughs> uh, and I'm actually going to go like this. Uh, and so now you should be able to see in the place of, uh, of my smiling face, you should be able to see a little 
uh, a little video of, uh, or a live feed rather, of one of our test robots. So in, in this case, uh, I have it pointing at a current generation full-size Echo Show. You can see the, uh, the Echo Show itself. You can see speaker and microphone, little camera, little computer over there that, uh, that is controlling everything. As John mentioned, these, uh, these cases are soundproofed. Uh, I have it open so you guys can actually hear what's going on. Um, but this, this really enables us to have lots and lots of them co-located with one another uh, without, you know, without interfering, uh, without audibly interfering with each other. So John had mentioned how the tests look exactly the same. So I have a, a really, really simple test here. Um, just to try to figure out what the weather is. So we say, you know, Alexa, what is the weather in hopefully? In Seattle. <laughs> you heard me on that one. So we say, A, what is the weather in Lima, Peru? And it should say in Lima, Peru, it's I don't know, some some kind of degrees Fahrenheit. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. Alexa, what is the weather in Lima, Peru? Currently, in Lima, Peru, it's 72 degrees Fahrenheit with sun and haze. Today, you can expect intermittent clouds with a high of 72 degrees and a low of 65 degrees. All right, so pretty pretty interesting there. So a couple a couple interesting takeaways. So first is that it mispronounced the word Lima. Uh, not not a huge surprise, you know. If uh, not not particularly surprising that the uh, Amazon Polly text to speech pronounce it like a lima bean instead of like Lima Peru. We'll we'll see what we can do to uh, to try and correct for that. Um, here on on the right hand side, I have kind of all of the response output that we got back. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and take a look. Let's take a look at this picture, see what it looks like. Yeah, so okay, so there we can see, you know, exactly what the image looks like that it would be doing the OCR and, uh, and image recognition on. And you can see that it's, it's a little blurry, it's a little out of focus. Uh, you know, again, these are designed to be uh, in the case, case completely closed, it gets, gets much crisper. Just to show you an idea of what that looks like. Here's one that I ran uh, right before we kicked off the webinar. Uh, so you can see it's totally in the dark, uh, but much, you know, much sharper image, much, uh, much more pleasant picture. And we, we actually do output exactly what that, the results of that OCR are. So here's, here's kind of the output from, the, uh, from that previous test. So you know, it gets it's pretty, pretty darn close. We see you know, it was 70 degrees, that's that extra zero. It had a bar between them, or 65 degrees. At trial, like, so what's the weather in Paris? Uh, so pretty, pretty amazing what uh, what it can do there. But kind of as we heard, you know, it's uh, it, it it mispronounced one of the words. And even even if you think about uh, about words that are easy to pronounce for you know native speakers of a language, that that might account for some of your users. It certainly doesn't account for all of your users. Uh, you know, there are a lot of circumstances where you may need to manipulate the pronunciation, either because it's a word that uh, text-to-speech might struggle with, or because you want to see what the experience would be for somebody who has a very thick American English accent or a very thick uh, non-American English accent. And so just the same way that in your skill or action, you can build in SSML, uh, we support that full capability as well. So, you know, I can do the exact same test, and I can say, you know, A, what is the weather in? And then I can use uh, the, the phonetic pronunciation to, uh, to actually change exactly how it's pronouncing it. So I'll go ahead and run that test. And we should hear it to hopefully pronounce it correctly. Alexa, what is the weather in Lima, Peru? Currently. In Lima, Peru, it's 72 degrees Fahrenheit with sun and haze. Today, you can expect intermittent clouds with a high of 72 degrees and a low of 65 degrees. <laughs> All right, so that one was uh, that one was a little bit better. Uh, actually, pronounced it correctly. Um, 
so that's so that's great. You know, those those are very very simple, uh, very simple tests validating you know just sort of one off interactions. But as John showed with the uh, with the bring example, it doesn't just have to be a one off utterance. We can actually get into you know more complex uh, more complex conversations. So in this case, I'm trying to set a timer. So I say a set a timer. Got some more SSML in there to pause for a little while and say that I want it to be a 30 minute timer. And then I'm going back in and checking what my timers are, making sure that I actually have them. Uh, in this case, it should hopefully verify that I do have a 30 minute timer with who knows how much time left, and then, uh, and then canceling that one. So let's give that. Alexa, set a timer. Timer for how long? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, starting now. Alexa, what are my timers? You have 29 minutes left on your 30 minute timer. Alexa, stop timer. 30 minute timer canceled. All right. So good, now it's not gonna go off after, uh, after this presentation is over. Um, so that's, you know, that that's, uh, it's great that we can do one-off utterances, great that we can do somewhat more complex, um, you know, more complex multi-turn dialogues or conversations, but it's, it's not, it's often not enough to just, uh, often not enough to just validate the audio response that comes back. As John had mentioned, we want to make sure uh, if we run into specific form factors, or if you have a multimodal application, which uh, you know many customers expect that you will have, I want to make sure that the other content comes back and is is displayed properly as well. So, uh, as as John mentioned, you know we do uh, we do optical character recognition to convert what is whatever's on the screen back to text. We can do image recognition to make sure things like logos are are displayed. Um, so in this case, you know I'm going to try and play some music. Uh, I'm going to try and play the station Z100 on iHeartRadio. And I expect that it should come back and tell me that Z100 is actually playing. Now, I've, I've got a couple different uh, potential responses back for this card content, for the sort of transcription of the, uh, or for the result of that OCR. And as I mentioned, we, we've got these cases open, so the, uh, you know, the camera is not tuned to kind of, uh, it's not tuned to perfectly operate in that environment. So hopefully it comes back and says Z100, but it might just say, you know, Z, 10 or ZIO might just say 100. Um, so, and, and again, you know, in, in a kind of production utilization, these would be, uh, would be closed and we would pass fail it based on, uh, based on whether or not exactly Z100 came back. Let's go ahead and give this a shot. Hopefully it's not any inappropriate music that's gonna play. Alexa, play Z100 on iHeartRadio. Getting Z100 station from Emerson's iHeartRadio account. <laughs> Alexa, stop music. Uh, that's apparently a song by Doja Cat. Not, uh, not familiar with that one. Uh, so great. So, you know, again, these uh, utilizing this really fairly simple approach to creating the tests, to enhancing the test to reflect, uh, you know, the content that you're serving back and then executing them in a repeated, um, repeated, unmonitored, reliable way really does both significantly increase uh, not only your efficiency as a developer or as a tester, certainly provides significant quality of life improvements from not having to sit and say, hey, play Z100 uh, you know, 50 times a day. Um, but utilizing things like the SSML, utilizing different, uh, different voices of generated audio, 
uh, also then in, increases your reach uh, and really lets you understand how it's going to perform, not just for someone with your particular accent, with your particular way of speaking, but with people who more accurately reflect the real individual users. So that's a you know that's a pretty simple example on uh, on Alexa, and again some of that stuff we can do with uh, we can do with our virtual devices today. But let's take a look at some other maybe more exciting use cases. And actually, just one question that I would highlight that we got um, as we so talk. Go ahead about and kick off one of. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh no, yeah, sorry. Uh, but just one question we got during manual testing. If there are many elements in the visual response, uh, can the user scroll horizontally or vertically to verify the response? How do the test robots test the visual response? In this case, um, I think that's an excellent question. Two things, one, you can speak to the device. You can speak to an Echo Show, for example, in order to do that sort of scrolling. I, I think for a lot of us, that doesn't necessarily come naturally, but that is capability where you can say, you know, Alexa more, Alexa next. Um, I think you can say up and down as well. Um, and so you can use those sort of voice commands to scroll. Additionally, there are other techniques that uh, we'll go into them at the moment, but fairly straightforward ways that we can also um, uh, handle the actual physical buttons. So if that's something of interest, um, certainly we can follow up with you on that. Great. Yeah, great. Yeah, uh, sorry, Everson, please proceed. Um, so here, here I have a video that I, I recorded uh, wow, back in March uh, of executing the uh, executing some simple tests against a first generation Facebook portal. And I, I don't know how many of you guys out there have a Facebook portal in your home. Um, it's a fa fascinating device because it has both obviously Facebook's assistant, the portal assistant, as well as Alexa on it. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a really interesting one where just using a virtual device, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to really interact with both of those different types of assistants, not to mention the fact that the Facebook portal is a totally closed ecosystem. Um, but something that is a, you know, really natural use case for these, uh, these test robots. For these tests, and you should be able to hear the test robot actually speaking the utterance and the response from the portal. Uh, here in the terminal window as well, you'll see any of the responses we're getting back. Transcription of the audio response and any text. Hey, Portal, what is the weather tomorrow? Tomorrow in Seattle, it'll be mostly cloudy with a high of 52 and a low of 41. Just a little bit. Here's the forecast for tomorrow in Seattle. Look for showers with a high of 52 uh, degrees what? Fahrenheit and a low of 42 degrees. And so we, you know, at, at the beginning we had talked about uh, my, from the first my natural call, yeah. bias, and uh, and I think many of us in the industry are thinking in a really smart speaker centric world. It's not limited to just testing things that look and act like smart speakers. One of the big use cases we see with some of our customers, um, both our automotive customers as well as people who are building experiences that someone could conceivably use in an automobile, uh, is wanting to actually test in cars. And so this is a, a demo that we've recorded for the Voice of the Car event last month. Um, in this case, I'm, uh, I'm driving a, uh, a Volvo, which uh, has its own interesting voice assistant capability. Uh, but I personally much more frequently use Android Auto uh, built in. And so that's what we're testing here. And you can actually see in this picture, uh, you can see the little camera that we have. You can see on my center console, the mic and speaker. Can't see the phone, which is kind of uh, kind of in front of it, um, but in the back we actually have the uh, the little computer itself that that's controlling everything, and it's uh, you know connected to cellular network for um, for data. And again, these the way that you write the test, the way that you execute the test is all exactly the same, regardless if you're using a virtual device, you're executing against a portal, or executing against you know some custom device that you might be developing. So let's see how uh, let's see how this works. Okay, Google. What are some nearby burger places? Showing results for what are some nearby burger places. Okay, whatever's nearest. So hungry. <laughs> Okay, 
Google? Navigate. All right, eight ounces. Burger and Co. Let's go. And so again, you know, we've we've uh, even in the. Okay, Google, stop. It's a uh, Nest Wi-Fi in the background that's listening now. Um, so you know, we've we've really found that uh, that there are just fascinating use cases that this opens up. In that case, I was actually physically driving around, um, a closed course professional driver, something like that. But um, but for you know for doing real testing i wouldn't actually need to be on the move i wouldn't need to be anywhere as long as i have some uh you know remote connectivity um in this case i was broadcasting cellular data from uh from cell phone but for example when we're doing some testing for uh doing some other automotive testing um just having close enough to a wi-fi and it really then you know removes the need for person to be sitting in the driver's seat, a uh, second person, the actual tester would be sitting in the passenger seat, people would be zipping around um, to, to understand the impact of changes that you're introducing, to understand how it's actually performing uh, while, you know, while you're on the fly. Those are fantastic demos, Emerson. Thank you for taking us through that. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again just to go through a couple of final slides and then uh, we'll leave it open for more questions. So this slide looks a bit repetitive, <laughs> but we put it here um, just because we do really like to emphasize that uh, ensuring that your users are well understood. It's the biggest challenge for voice. Um, and the solution that we offer, both in terms of the virtual devices as well as the test robots, is really by far the best way uh, to actually make a dent in that. So if you really, you know, if you're serious about your voice experiences, as you know, I would say many, if not all of our customers are, and you really want to deliver uh, something that's great uh, for your customers, something that they're gonna come back to, um, this is a problem that you need to concentrate on. Uh, and we are really happy to report that it's not something that, we, that you need a PhD in AI to do. Uh, most of the tuning techniques are really, um, I mean, we didn't include them in this demo, but they're really simple. A lot of it just comes down to adding synonyms. So you don't have to think about this in despair, like you've got to go and learn how to do acoustic modeling or um, you know, apply advanced machine learning algorithms. Uh, not at all. Uh, and in fact, you couldn't even if you wanted to, because for most of the platforms, you don't have that sort of access. But just using fairly simple techniques, uh, you can really make a profound difference. Um, and so during this presentation, uh, you know, we like to think that we've established that there's some significant challenges with development and testing. Um, you know, making sure that things work in a high quality way across platforms, um, you know, as well as making sure that you're actually testing the scenarios that are most relevant uh, to your users. Um, you know, so given all these things um, and all these sorts of challenges that we have, how do we then best actually solve this? Uh, well, Emerson found this slide, and I'm going to give him credit for it, but uh, <laughs> this slide, but Alec Baldwin uh, famously said, always be closing in the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Well, our answer to this is always be testing. Uh, we think that's the best way to build an AI system. Uh, it might be the best way to save the world from a terrible virus as well. Uh, but overall, testing, we think uh, it may not be the answers to all the world's problems, but it's, it's really a big part of it. Um, and it's really an essential part of building for voice and AI. Um, so, you know, don't be intimidated by it. We're here to help you. Uh, we try to make it very easy. Um, you know, if you have questions for us now, um, which, you know, we welcome, um, you know, it's a great time to ask them, but you can also just reach out to us at any point. We're happy to talk to you. We're happy to brainstorm around your use cases. 
Um, you know, and we like it if people throw challenging problems at us. I mean, we think we can solve them. Um, and we've got a good track record. It's an excellent track record of solving some pretty complex testing problems. So we have a, a couple questions open. Uh, Michael, you would ask, can we see an error get caught what is shown? I don't have a great example of an error. I can, can certainly send you one, but it, it mimics, uh, I guess not mimics, it's, it's identical to, uh, to what you would see getting an error with the regular, uh, the regular virtual device approach. So for example, if I expected to say, Z100 in that one example, and it comes back and uh, says it's Z104 or something like that. Um, you know, that will get flagged. It'll show what the expected response was, what the actual response was, and you can see kind of there's the difference. In a more, uh, we're, we're big proponents of DevOps here, in a more, uh, I would say, productionalized type environment, our recommendation is to push these results to platforms that people have visibility in. Um, that you know people can actually leverage and, and act upon and so if you're using something you know if you if you only have something like a ci tool like jenkins and you want your pass fail tests to show up in jenkins that's a good first step if you're using uh, an analytics and monitoring tool something like datadog or app dynamics it's easy to push these results directly up there so that it's not just me as uh, mr developer who can see the results but it's you know everybody else on the team who can have that visibility Mark, you asked, are the robots for sale or are they used as part of a service that you provide? Uh, a little bit of both. So we, uh, as, as it stands now, most of the RoboLamas are in our device lab. Um, we do have some customers who have pre-production devices that are of a sensitive nature such that they couldn't provide it to us, you know, not a commercially available device. Um, not something that we could put put in our internal device lab, and so um, so delivering and establishing those same kind of device setups in someone else's lab is uh, you know is fairly straightforward. Um, but it is all it is all part of the core central service that we have. Um, utilize the same type of licensing scheme. Um, you know, the, again, the the tests and execution, everything else is is the same. Yeah, and I would also just highlight with that, I mean, if you do have a testing need that would require one of these test robots, you know, it's not as fast to set up as a virtual device, which is like two clicks, but, you know, we can provision these things extremely quickly. It's not like there's some big turn around time. Um, we, we try to make it, we really try to make it feel as seamless as possible between whether you're using these test robots or the virtual devices. I mean, there, there's a difference in the use cases, so it's not like there's, there's no distinction between them, but uh, in terms of the APIs, in terms of the way that we provision them, uh, we really try to um, just make it almost transparent to the user. And I think, uh, Michael, you asked about capturing errors in the DB. I think Emerson answered that pretty well, but we use Datadog a lot for that, you know, whatever other types of reporting and monitoring systems customers have in place. Two more minutes to one, any, any more questions for us? All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I hope uh, I hope you found it found it interesting and exciting. Um, like John said, you know we really look for interesting, challenging, compelling use cases. Um, so if if you have some kind of unique need that might be solved by virtual devices, might be solved by test robots, you know we we welcome the challenge. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day.